Welcome to Sensation and Perception, part two. So last time we talked about the difference between sensation and perception, parts of the eyeball, and specifically we talked about monocular depth cues. Now I wanna start talking about binocular depth cues. Binocular means two, right? Two eyes, binocular. So these two depth cues that we're gonna discuss require two eyeballs, right? You have to have two eyes. A lot of the time when people talk about depth perception, they're actually talking about this, the binocular disparity. Binocular disparity means that there's a disparity between the two eyeballs that you have, right? So one eyeball sees one thing and another eyeball sees another thing. You can see this when you stick your finger out, right? You stick your finger in front of you and then look at it with one eyeball and keep your finger where it is, but just switch the eyes, right? It looks like the finger moves. Well, what's going on is you see one image with this eyeball, the right eyeball, and you see a separate image with the left eyeball. Your brain takes these two pieces of information, these two images, and puts them together. And based off of how disparate or different they are, it can tell how far away the object is. So when your finger is close to you, if you close one eyeball and then close, and then close the other, you switch, right? You'll see that the finger, the two images, the finger is very different, right? It moves quite a bit. But something far away, like my wall in the background, doesn't move nearly as much as my finger does between those two images. Your brain knows that if something is very different in the two images, then it must be closer to you. If it's not very different in the two images, then it must be farther away. So for example, if you look right here, the image of the uh, policeman and the tree, the policeman is closer. And so in one eyeball, you'll see where the policeman is in a different place than where in the other eyeball, right? But the policeman is a very different place between the two images, as if he was moving back and forth like that. Your brain sticks those two pieces of information together, says, oh, the policeman must be this far away, whereas the tree must be this far away, based off of how distant they are, how different they are in the two images. This is how we do 3D movies, right? This is how we do 3D movies. Now, let me show you this. We use binocular disparity to, to make 3D. Nowadays, we don't use the red and the green, red and blue, like I have in, in these 3D glasses. Instead, we use some polarity, but it does the same thing. It gives one image, a, a, one image to your left eye, a separate image to your right eye, and your brain puts those two different images together and makes it look like things are closer or farther away. So for example, in this image, when you look at it without glasses, it just looks kind of weird, right? Looks like some weirdness, right? But when I look at it, it also looks weird until I close my eye, right, with the glasses on. What's going on is when I can only see when the red part is filtered out. So right, so this the red part is gonna filter my left eye. If I look just through my left eye, I can only see the blue because the red is being filtered out. And I see that it says beauty is in the eye of the beholder. However, that image is quite different than the blue image, right? The blue filters out the red and I can know, know uh, blue filters out the blue, right? So all I can see is the red and I don't see that same message. When you combine those two effects together, then you can create 3D. So when I'm looking at this with my 3D glasses, the tiger looks like it's jumping out. When you're looking at it without your 3D glasses, you can see that there's red and blue. Specifically in the, the paw that's closest to you, the red and the blue lines are quite different. They're quite spread out, right? That's because what we're doing is forcing the red, we're, we're forcing the, the, uh, you to see something very different with the blue compared to the red. In the background, like the tail, the red and the blue are not very different from each other. And so what happens is that makes it look like it's popping out of the screen because it's showing a very different image of red, uh, of red and blue in the two different eyeballs, creating more disparity in the images and making it look like it's popping out of the screen. If you buy these, these are pretty cheap. You can get them online wherever you want. You can spend all day and all night looking at 3D movies on YouTube and videos and stuff like that. But that's what's going on. You're just showing your eyeball, your different eyeballs, two different images. Your brain puts them together and says, oh, based off of how different they are, I know that these things that are very different should be close, the things that are not very different should be far, and it creates a sense of depth. Binocular disparity. 
the disparity between the two images in the two eyeballs. There's another binocular depth cue, and that is convergence. Binocular disparity is the one we just talked about. Convergence is different. If you get an object like this pen, right? Let me get a different pen, maybe one that'll show up a little bit better. There we go, red pen, all right, great. When I look at this pen, my two eyes converge. And if the pen is close, they converge more. If the pen is farther away, they converge less. Your brain can sense how much your eyeballs are converging, how much they're crossing with each other. If they're crossing a lot, then the object must be very close. If they're not crossing very much, then the object must be far away. And your brain senses the angle of the convergence of your eyeballs and says, well, if it's really close, then it must, if, if, I'm, if my eyes are converging a lot, then that thing must be close by. If they are not converging very much, then it must be farther away. We need to talk about rods versus cones. So you remember in, the, in your eyesight, the light goes into your eye and your lens focuses it on the fovea. The fovea is a part of your retina, the whole back of your eyeball. The retina is where you have cells that can sense light. The cells that can sense light are rods and cones. Cones are most able to distinguish colors, whereas rods are in charge of dark and light, that kind of thing. In your fovea, you have the highest concentration of cones. So the one at the top, the cell at the top, looks more like a cone. That's because that's a cone. The rods at the bottom. So the cones are more involved with uh, perceiving color. All right, keep that in mind. Cones are involved with keeping color. So we're going to do a an example of how to mess with your cones and what's interesting about this is that your cones are kind of like i gotta be careful but they're kind of like a pixel on a tv it's not like each pixel has every single color in it it's the combination of three different colors that can create three different pixels right that can create all the colors it's kind of like the way that your printer uh, mixes the cyan, the magenta, and the yellow to, to, uh, together to get the different colors, all right? Your cones, at least we believe their cones, do a similar thing. There's some kind of cones that, that have one color and not the other. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to test you with after images. So here's what's going to happen. I am going, let's just make sure that we're all clear. I'm not showing you a video. There's no videos involved. These are all just pictures. And if you want to go and find these online and print them out to make sure that I'm not lying to you, then that's totally fine with me. Do whatever you need to do. But this castle, you see this castle? It's a black and white picture. Can we all agree on that? So this is in black and white. There's no colors involved. Well, here's what we're gonna do. I need you to stare. I don't know if you see that little dot in the middle, but I'm gonna make you look at this. I want you to keep staring at the dot. Keep staring at the dot. What's gonna happen, I'm gonna you know, keep staring at the dot. We need your eyes to get a little bit tired, right? Or else this is not gonna work. Keep staring at the dot. Keep staring at the dot. Keep staring at the dot. It was not a video. This picture is the same picture that I showed you before, the black and white picture. This is the black and white picture. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Stare at the middle of the screen. Stare at that dot. We've got to get your eye a little bit tired. You're going to stare at it. You're going to let your eye get a little bit tired. Okay, stare at it. And then I'm going to show you the black and white picture. And I promise you, it is the same black and white picture. So I'm doing it too. Staring. Keep watching it. You should have seen this picture in color, and then it fades away. The color just fades out until you see the black and white. It is not a video or a GIF or anything else. It is your eyeball creating an after image. So the theory, one of the theories as to why this works is that the different cones in your eyeballs keep they send their signal, right? So 
what we actually see right here is the opposite color, uh, colors of what you would want to see in a color photograph. So notice how the orange is the opposite of blue, that kind of a thing. What's going on is as we stare at this, we're fatiguing the cones. And so as we fatigue the cones, we switch to the black and white and your cones relax and they actually send the opposite signal to your brain. And you perceive the opposite color of what you were originally sensing. This is a black and white picture. It is and always has been, but your cones are sending you an after image. All right, which structure of the eye is responsible for color visions? Vision? It's the cones. The cones. Cones are the cells in the retina that uh, are responsible for color vision. Their highest concentration is in the fovea. Here is another uh, very famous illusion. Now, if you want to, you can actually stick a, get a piece of paper or something and stick it on here. But what I want you to do is I want you, before you do that, I guess, is to tell me of those color swatches, which shade is the B square, right? The squared labeled B, what shade is that? Okay, now I am not showing you a video now. If you wanna do the same process with a piece of paper just on your screen and just cover it up, you can do the same thing. But what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna be adding white space. I'm just adding white space. I'm not altering the actual image itself, I promise. I'm just adding white around everything else. A and B, the A and B squares are exactly the same shade of gray. They're exactly the same color. You don't believe me? By the way, it's number five. That was the right answer. B is the same color as five. And I'm not talking about the letter. I'm talking about the square that the letter is on. You don't believe me? Let's do it one more time. You can do this with a piece of paper if you want. All I have done is covered up everything except for the A and B square with white. Why does this work? This works because your brain knows things. It knows that on a checkerboard, you have white squares and black squares, and that those white squares are supposed to be consistently the same color. It knows that things in shadows appear darker. It knows that, uh, and, it, and, it, and based on its expectations, you assume those things. This is not a photo though, this is a drawing and it's meant to manipulate your perception. It turns out the information that the brain, brain receives can be manipulated and can mess with your perception. All right, let's move on to a different sense and perception. The sensation of smell is known as, the sensation of smell is known as olfaction olfaction. So what I want to talk about the olfaction, there's a lot of stuff we don't know about olfaction still. Boy, if you can figure out everything about how olfaction works, you're, you're going to be really smart. But olfaction is your sense of smell. What I want to talk about is the idea of pheromones. Pheromones. So pheromones are chemicals that produce a reaction in a, a member of a species. So normally this is a chemical that is produced by one member of a species that creates a reaction in, in another member of the same species. The most common way people think about this is with a sex pheromone. A sex pheromone is a, is a, uh, a chemical that often a female will produce that creates sexual arousal in the male, right? It can be other way around. It doesn't have to be females. Anyway, the, the point is that the chemical itself is causing a sexual arousal. It's the chemical itself causing the sexual arousal. So what we wanna talk about is, do pheromones exist? Do sex pheromones exist for humans? And is that through your sense of smell? So we certainly know that with certain insects, their pheromones are very, very important. 
and cause very distinct reactions in other members of the opposite sex and et, et cetera, in, in, in general. But does that mean that somebody who's sweating causes you to become sexually aroused? The sense of smell and the idea of pheromones are not exactly the same thing. There is not a lot of evidence that, uh, that pheromones, that there's actual chemicals that cause sexual arousal. It turns out humans are sexually aroused pretty easily by a sense of sight or touch. And the sense of smell is not quite as big a deal uh, in terms of actually creating the sexual arousal. But you're saying, oh, but wait a minute. I know that whenever I smell this certain perfume, I get sexually aroused right away. Is that because you were born that way? Are you saying that out of the womb or as soon as you hit puberty, suddenly that immediately caused you to be sexually aroused? I don't think that's what's going on. I think what's happening is you have become classically conditioned to associate arousal with a smell. So that smell could be chocolate chip cookies. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be Dracar Noir or whatever, whatever the scent happens to be. You just associated that scent with somebody you were sexually attracted to. And now whenever you smell that scent, you become sexually attracted. Now, does that mean that your sense of smell doesn't have uh, important effects? No, it, there's some interesting effects that still happen. Let's go ahead and watch this video about how the sense of smell might be associated with ideas of attraction. So in that video you watched, you saw that, uh, at least their contention, was that you should think the smell of someone who is more, is different than you in your, in, uh, in your immune system would be more attractive. And the idea there is that if you mate with someone who is very different from you in your immune system, that your offspring would have more, uh, more protection against different diseases because they'd have a different immune system than yours, and therefore they'd have a variety of, of immune uh, responses. What we do know is that the sense of smell can be quite powerful and it seems that people uh, actually do sense attractiveness in smell. Now I'm not saying this is a pheromone because I don't think it is, but I'm saying that there's something about the scent of others that is inherently attractive. Not that they're wearing perfume, but just attractive. So for example, there's several studies that have found that if you you take a bunch of people, you rate them, have a bunch of people, just give them a hot or not score, like just rate them on how attractive they are. And then you have, you give them all a brand new t-shirt. You say, okay, go sleep in this t-shirt. So there's no, they, normally they have them take a, a shower with non-scented anything, right? So they take a shower, they sleep in the t-shirt, then they pick up the t-shirt, put it in a box, kind of like what you, what you saw, and you have people uh, smell the t-shirts. The people who are rated most visually attractive have the better smelling shirts. Hotter people smell, their, their sweat smells better. Now, is that because you're born with their scent being more attractive? Or have you just associated certain scents, maybe even naturally occurring scents, with physically attractive people? It's hard to tell the difference, especially when we are involved with things like classical conditioning. All right, review question. Microcicades are caused by extraocular muscles. Remember, those are the ones, the extraocular outside of the eyeball, extraocular muscles. All right, let's keep going on this. The lens focuses light onto the most sensitive part of our retina, where cones are densely packed. That part of the retina is called the fovea. It's called the fovea. That's where we focus our light. All right, let's talk a little bit about bottom-up versus top-down processing. When we talk about perception, we're talking about understanding what things are. So when you look at this image, it should be pretty easy for you to be able to see a Dalmatian, a dog. In reality, though, it's just a bunch of dots. Top-down processing is the use of context to understand what's going on. So a lot of the monocular depth cues that we talked about, familiar size, shadow, those kind of things, are using top-down processing. They're understanding everything in their context. Bottom-up processing is the opposite way. It's where you have to take each individual dot, each individual piece of information, and once you have all of them together, then you can understand what the image is supposed to be. So in this case, you're using top-down processing because you know what a dog, a Dalmatian, is supposed to look like. 
And based off of that overall image, you can say, oh, hey, based off of the way these are just these are put together, I can tell that this is meant to be a dog. Instead of just saying, oh, got a dot, got another dot, I'll have to wait till I get all the dots before I can figure out what this is. So this sold for $28,000 on eBay. Why? Because people see an image of Jesus in it. In reality, it just happens to be the way that this was grilled. But we are top-down processors. Almost all of the perception that we do is top-down. We perceive continuity. We perceive images. We perceive the whole, even though we don't have all the information. This helps us quite a bit so that we can process things relatively quickly. So for example, constellations, that's all top-down processing. There's no actual picture of a dude with a shield or anything else in Orion. That's not how it goes. But we like to see images. If you've ever looked at the clouds and say, oh, that one looks like a duck, then you're using top-down processing. Bottom-up processing says, oh, there's a bunch of dots. Oh, there's a bunch of water molecules. Oh, there's a bunch of stars. Let's talk about hearing. I want you to watch this video about hearing, and then we'll talk about it. So in that video, you learned about how we hear. So our ear, the outside ear, we call this the pinna. The pinna takes in sound waves. And what happened is the sound waves will wiggle your eardrum. The eardrum is also called the tympanic membrane. And what happens is when the eardrum wiggles, it moves your incus, malleus, and stapes, right, those, those, uh, those bones, which are connected to your cochlea. Now, inside of your cochlea, that's where you have those little hair-like receptors that when they're wiggled the right way, that's actually how you perceive, uh, that's, how, that's the sensation of sound, which then is sent to your brain. So for example, you may have heard of a cochlear implant. For somebody who is deaf, they might have received a cochlear implant. And what happens is through surgery, it takes the, the implant on the outside of their brain, goes straight into their, um, their auditory nerve and just bypasses the ear altogether because it can do the same thing. It can receive sound and send it to your brain. By the way, the semicircular canals, those are meant mainly for like balance. It's less, those don't really pick up the sounds, right? The semicircular canals do not uh, pick up, do not sense the actual sound waves. So what's going on here is that there's a lot of different parts that could be harmed if you have problems with your ear. So for example, if you burst your eardrum, then it can't wiggle the bones, which can't wiggle the fluid that's inside of your ear, and therefore you won't be able to sense hearing, right? There's a lot of ways that you could do that. Or you could damage the little hairs that are inside the cochlea, and that would also damage your hearing. There's lots of ways to damage your hearing. Just like with uh, vision though, we can actually perceive and localize sound based off of our perceptions. So the, the sensations and the context of the sensations will help us to understand what's going on with sound. So for example, if, how do you know where a sound is coming from? This is what this is talking about, okay? How do you know where sounds are coming from? Well, this has to do with pitch and it has to do with arrival time and some other things as well. But here's the basic idea of how you would know. So for example, you have two ears, just like you have two eyes and the binocular disparity will help you to understand where it is. Well, the, binoc the, the two ears also will get two different sounds. And even those, the, and those are slightly different in where they are, right? They're slightly different in their pitch and they're slightly different in the way that they arrive in your ear. So if something is coming from this side, right? It's coming from over here. It's gonna arrive in this ear before it arrives in this ear. And so my brain puts those sounds together and says, oh, but this one arrived first. And so therefore it's coming from that direction. Just like you can use uh, cues to visualize depth and how far away things are, your ears can also do the same thing. Visual capture is the idea that even though uh, even though 
my mouth is actually moving quite a bit differently than the sound, you can actually perceive that it's my mouth that's creating that sound. Now, when people are far away, you see things a lot sooner than you hear them. But your brain has, does a pretty good job of connecting the sound with the movement of the mouth, for example, even though they're far away, or maybe the sound is actually coming from a speaker, but your brain says, oh, I know it's coming from that mouth. And so it perceives it coming from that place. All right, thanks everybody.